Good morning and welcome to our live morning worship, to all of you, to those who are here physically in the church, and to all who are joining us by live streaming on Zoom. We welcome our minister this morning, Reverend Kevin Price, from Wellspring Church in Worksworth. There's few notices. Um, there's a property meeting tomorrow evening uh, at... I don't know if it's a 7.30, for those of you who are involved in that. Wednesday is the prayer group meeting on Zoom. All are welcome to come along and join in the meeting. Penny, Rowanna and Alison all have the details for the Zoom link. Thursday, they have the coffee morning at 10.30 on Zoom. Alison Dorset has the details. Mike Haynes, Mike Tomlinson, Reverend Colin Smith, Joshua Haynes and some others are doing a 45 mile or 75 kilometres walk on the bank holiday weekend, 28th to 31st of May. And this is to raise money for the Christian aid. Mike has the details for the Just Giving site or you probably can just give donations to one of the walkers. And Alison Dowsett is also raising money by challenging herself, herself to be taking photos of a hundred different flowers. And then she's going to post them on her Facebook page over the next weeks. She's looking to raise £175 and so far she's raised £100, which is absolutely wonderful. Many of you will have heard the news that Jane Hall sadly passed away Tuesday, the 18th of May. So far, I've not got any details about a funeral or when the funeral will be held. I believe it will be held here at this church. And apart from that, I don't know any more than that. So now if we'd like to pray. Lord God Almighty, we praise you for who you are and what you have done. You are the healer, bringing healing in their place. You are our righteousness, bringing transformation in this place. You are the provider, increase our trust in you. You are the God who is with us. Let us enter your presence. You are the Lord of hosts. Bring victory in our struggles. You are the God of peace. Bring comfort in our chaos. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now to our minister, Reverend Kevin. Greetings from our, our church at Wellspring in Worksworth and um, also the fellowship at Cromford Methodist with whom we, we are sharing worship in these days um, as we await for the completion of our building works at, uh, up at Wellspring. And today is the day of Pentecost and we gather to worship God and we recall the words of Jesus who said, I myself will send upon you what my Father has promised, but you must wait in the city until the power from above comes down upon you. And so our first hymn this morning is an invocation to God to send the Holy Spirit upon us. Come down, O love divine. And... Uh, all our words are going to be up on screen. We're going to be having uh, digital music in some shape or form. Uh, and uh, if you can bear with me, I, I will lead us in singing. And so we pray. Spirit of compassion, we bring you our hearts. Spirit of discernment, we bring you our choices. 
Spirit of Wisdom, we bring you our minds. Spirit of Boldness, we bring you our words. Spirit of Fulfillment, we bring you our longings. Spirit of Abundance, we bring you our resources. Spirit of Creation, we bring you our lives. Now we share in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So as well as being uh, Pentecost Sunday, uh, today is, uh, for Methodist people, Alders Gate Sunday. Uh, and um, uh, as a Baptist minister uh, and now working in an LEP and very much part of uh, the circuit, I, I've, I've become acquainted with what this means uh, within the Methodist tradition. And I understand that it, it, it falls on this Sunday because it's the nearest Sunday to the 24th of May, uh, which was the date in 1738 when John Wesley went to a meeting at Aldergate Street in London when he says he felt his heart strangely warmed and he felt he did trust Christ, Christ alone, for salvation. So we're going to proclaim that faith and that trust now as we sing once again, In Christ alone my hope is found. Such uh, wonderful words of reassurance in Christ alone our hope is found. So we're going to pause for a moment and uh, acknowledge God's goodness to us. I, I, I understand there's a, an offering basket in the, in the vestibule which you can put your usual offerings in um, on your way in, on, on your way out. And we also acknowledge the fact that um, many people have given to the work of this church and the work of the kingdom in, in different ways uh, through through standing orders and through uh, internet banking and all kinds of other ways. So we, we want to acknowledge God's goodness to us, so let's give thanks. On this day, Lord our God, we uh, acknowledge and thank you as the giver of all good gifts, the giver of the Holy Spirit, the giver of Jesus, our Saviour, the giver of the gift of life. And so we thank you for all that you provide for us and all that we are entrusted with. Uh, and through our offerings, not just of money, but of our lives, our gifts and our talents, we, we give back to you and offer these things for the work of your kingdom. For as you gave us your spirit to help us in your work, so we ask, Lord our God, Take and use all that we offer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So our reading from Scripture this morning comes from the book of Acts in chapter 2 uh, and uh, the, f the first 21 verses. So this morning's reading is taken from the Good News Bible, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 21. When the day of Pentecost came, all the believers were gathered together in one place. And suddenly there was a noise from the sky, which sounded like a strong wind blowing. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. 
Then they saw what looked like tongues of fire, which spread out and touched each person there. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to talk in other languages, as the Spirit enabled them to speak. There were Jews living in Jerusalem, religious men who had come from every country of the world. When they heard this noise, a large crowd gathered, and they were all excited because each one of them heard the believers speaking in his own language. In amazement and wonder, they exclaimed, These people who are talking like this are Galileans. How is it then that all of us can hear them speaking in our own native languages? We are from Partha, Parthia, Media, Elam, from Mesopotamia, Judea, and the Cappadocia, from Pontius and Asia, from Philigia and Pamphylia, from Egypt and from regions of Libya, near Syria. Some of us are from Rome. Both Jews and Galileans converted to Judaism. And some of us are from Crete and Arabia. Yet all of us hear them speaking in our own language about the great things that God has done. Amazed and confused, they kept asking each other, what does this mean? But others made fun of the believers, saying, these people are drunk. Then Peter stood up with the other apostles and in a loud voice began to speak to the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, listen to me and let me tell you what this means. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It is only nine o'clock in the morning. Instead, this is what the prophet Joel spoke about. This is what I will do in the last days, God said. I will pour out my spirit on everyone. Your sons and daughters will proclaim my message. Your younger men will see visions and your old men will have dreams. Yes, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will proclaim my message. I will perform miracles in the sky above and wonders on the earth below. There will be blood, fire, thick smoke, the sun will be darkened and the moon will turn red as blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. And then whoever calls out to the Lord for help will be saved. Thanks be to God. Tricky place names uh, within within the reading, but thank you. Place names are, are familiar to me because I, I studied geography as my first degree. Not that it's all about places in the world, but um, that was my first um, attempt at, 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 at studying. And my second was training for ministry when uh, I went to, to train to become a Baptist minister in, in 2009. And I went to Regent's Park College in Oxford and uh, one Monday morning, a student came into chapel and declared that there was a fire outside the theology faculty, and some said it was an act of God. And in the afternoon, there was another fire. This time, it was at the Eagle and Child, which is the nearest pub to our college, and some said it was an act of God. And on the day of Pentecost, there was fire, and this was an act of God. Let's pray for a moment. Lord, once again, as we hear the story of uh, what happened on that day of Pentecost, we are enthralled. Our minds are captivated by visions of fire and we can hear the sound of the rushing wind and the babbling of tongues. Uh, and we might, in this day and age, say with the people of that day, what 
does this mean? So I do pray that through your spirit you will enlighten us this morning as we once again revisit this occasion. Amen. So let's recall Jesus in the upper room with his disciples prior to his arrest, his trial and his crucifixion. Amongst the many things he shares with them that evening, he talks a lot about the Spirit. Once Jesus has gone, God the Father will send the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus as another advocate, a helper, a counsellor, one who comes alongside. And Jesus continues to say that this is the Spirit of truth, the one who is with him and with the Father, who will remain with the disciples and remind them of all the things that Jesus has taught them. But he will guide them into truth. He will testify about him. He will convict the world of sin and in everything glorify Jesus. And Jesus said to them in the upper room, unless I go away, the Spirit will not come to you. Not that it's the sole reason why Jesus went to the cross, but through this, the church was born. Through this event, humanity was able to be renewed through the power of the Spirit. And in Acts chapter 1, we, we read of the ascension. And Jesus said to the disciples on that occasion, Do not leave Jerusalem. Wait for the gift my Father promised. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And so when we get to Acts chapter 2, we're on the day of Pentecost. It's 50 days following the Passover. The disciples were together in Jerusalem and the city was packed with Jewish pilgrims uh, visiting for the festival. Just as they had for the Passover seven weeks earlier when Jesus was crucified. And we read that there was a violent wind and there were tongues of fire that came and rested on the disciples. And both wind and fire are symbols of the Holy Spirit who came and filled them and they praised God in other languages, languages that were understood by those who gathered in Jerusalem for the festival. Such, it was so confusing that such that those who gathered said they're drunk. Others said, what does this mean? What does this mean? So let's have a look. Firstly, uh, this is an act of creation. The events of that day were the sign of a new creation, a new beginning. The coming of the wind and the filling of the Spirit reminds us of the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the waters in Genesis. As the formless void is about to be transformed into an ordered universe. And it was by his spirit that, according to the psalmist, God continued to renew life on the earth. And by his spirit, God is now undertaking an act of renewal, an act of creation. And in this, God was at work creating a new body called the church. The 11 plus the 3,000 converts of that day became the church and they told the good news of Jesus Christ, just as he said, in Jerusalem, in Samaria and beyond. And it was the birth of a new body that was to live by and in the Spirit, free of the demands of the law, becoming Christ-like as the Spirit indwelt and changed lives as they grew and produced his fruit, and one that would be empowered to witness and take the message of the gospel into all the world, and that's into all, not just all countries, but into all societies, into all subcultures, to proclaim God's standards of personal and communal righteousness. And Pentecost reminds us and assures us that whatever the world may seem like, and we seem to live in a very strange world at the moment. We live in a universe in which God is at work to recreate and to reorder that which has become unraveled and distorted. The Holy Spirit continues to renew lives, to renew churches, to renew communities, and to renew nations. As the Apostle Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone. The new 
is here. So it's an act of creation. It's also an act of unification. Now that sounds like some historic act of Parliament joining England to Scotland in an arranged marriage. A bit of a moot point at the moment. But this was an act of unification. These events were the sign of a new unification, a new coming together of human beings. Genesis chapter 11 tells the story of how following a proud attempt to achieve strength and unity through building a city and a tall tower, God scattered the people of the earth and confused their speech. And maybe in that story, in that symbolic act, God's aim was to protect his created beings from becoming so proud and self-sufficient that they forget their creator. And perhaps we experience this today. As I said earlier, Jerusalem was full of Jewish pilgrims visiting for the festival and for the feast of Pentecost. And they will have come into Jerusalem from the dispersed communities living in Greece and Turkey and Egypt and other parts of of the world, especially North Africa. And uh, then they hear the disciples proclaiming the greatness of God in the language of the places that they've come from. And I've often thought there's a kind of reverse Babel going on here. At Babel, God confuses people's language so that they can't understand one another and are prevented from becoming one great God-like people through their own efforts. And at Pentecost, God confuses the disciples' speech so that the once scattered and linguistically confused people can understand the greatness of God and are brought back together to become one great people, not through their own efforts, but through the work of God through the death and resurrection of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And on that day, for a short while, the embryonic church was united. Just think about it. No denominations. It was not long until there were signs, however, of disagreement and division. And sadly, the history of the church is one of division and disunity. And yet unity is what was intended for the for the church, as Paul urges the church at Ephesus to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So it's an act of unification. It's also an act of adoption. In one of the other readings for today, in Romans chapter 8, Paul writes, For those who are led by the Spirit are children of God. The Spirit you received brought about your adoption. He talks of the Spirit bringing us to adoption as children of God. And by the Spirit coming down upon believers, this has brought us into the family of God in a new, fresh and exciting way. This intimacy has been known exclusively by certain individuals in the past. Key leaders, judges, prophets of the Old Testament And then before the time of Jesus, we read of Mary and Zechariah and John the Baptist all being filled with the Holy Spirit. But now the Spirit is poured out on all who will receive him by confessing Jesus as Lord. Peter concludes his speech to the crowd at Pentecost with this question, or answering the question they put to him. Brothers, what shall we do? And he says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and all who are far off. I remember going to some, uh, maybe some youth meetings in, in, the, in the 1980s when, when there was a a British telecom advertising slogan going around. If you remember, it's for yoo-hoo. Remember that one? Go back a long time, it's showing my age. But um, this is what, what they're saying here. This is what's coming out through Scripture, that the promise of the Holy Spirit, there's no exclusion. It's for you. It's for every one of us. But this act of adoption is only just the start. For those who... Adopt children once the legal paperwork is done and the children are settled into their new home and family. That's not the completion of the process. It's the start of a journey of care, of nurturing, a mutual family relationship that will continue 
for the rest of the lives of those concerned. So the giving, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the first believers on the day of Pentecost was just the start. Paul, writing to the church in Corinth, twice speaks of the Holy Spirit as a deposit, a down payment, a guarantee of what is to come. So it's an act of adoption. But it's also, finally, an act of fulfilment. Pentecost signals the fulfilment of prophecies and promises. The promises of the new covenant as an age of the Spirit was prophesied by Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And here Peter cites the promises of God spoken through various prophets and through the prophet Joel in particular to pour out his Spirit on all people irrespective of age and gender and status. This was something that the apostles had to learn later on in Acts. But he says, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Significantly, women will prophesy. Young men and old men will have revelations. Everyone is included, even middle-aged men like me. Joel's prophecy explains the multilingual experience of that special day when the greatness of God was proclaimed by the gathered crowd in the languages of those who listened. And says that people of all kinds may now receive direct insight into the reality of God, along with the ability to speak of it. There were also promises of Jesus himself to the disciples recorded in John's Gospel uh, in chapters 14 to 17 and in Acts chapter 1. And the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost is in fulfilment of all these promises. A unique event, but only the start of the age of the church. The one when Jesus' ministry of teaching, of revelation, of healing and deliverance would continue as he would be present by his Spirit. And before his ascension, Jesus told his disciples they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And I recall John the Baptist prophesying that the one who would come after him would be the one who baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And the root meaning of baptize is to be totally immersed in something. And the question I have on this day is how immersed are we in the Holy Spirit of God? Because his coming at Pentecost was an act of fulfillment. And if I can play with this word fulfillment just for a moment, are we going to allow him to fill us fully? We need to continue to be open to allowing him to fill all aspects of our lives daily, to be immersed in the things of God. When I was training for ministry down in, in uh, Northamptonshire, not far from Huntingdon, I came across um, a story about a woman who was known as the, the Countess of Huntingdon. Uh, she was a contemporary of John Wesley, who we think about on this day. And on her gravestone, it is written, she was a good, just, righteous and sober lady, a firm believer in the gospel of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, and devoid of the taint of enthusiasm. Enthusiasm, a taint. On the day of Pentecost, these ordinary men, and among them Galilean fishermen, became enthusiastic to witness to the truth they believed, that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, the Messiah, that he died and rose again. The disciples were totally immersed in the Spirit, and their enthusiasm was so extreme that some thought they were drunk. But as Peter pointed out, it was only 9 a.m. So, to conclude, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost was a unique event. To put God's seal upon and his power within the church. And we now live in the age of the Spirit, between the ascension of Jesus and his ultimate return. And during this time, the Apostle Paul urges us to be filled 
and continue to let God fill us with his spirit so that we live in the spirit. We are immersed in the spirit and we experience the things of the spirit in our lives, his gifts and his fruit. John Stott has written, without the Holy Spirit, Christian discipleship would be inconceivable, even impossible. There can be no life without the life giver, no understanding without the spirit of truth, no fellowship without the unity of the spirit, no Christ-likeness of character apart from his fruit, and no effective witness without his power. As a body without breath is a corpse, so the church without the spirit is dead. The spirit of renewal, of unity, of adoption and fulfillment. The Holy Spirit of God is with us. May we allow him to fill our lives and this church to the glory of God. Amen. We're going to respond to God's word by, by singing once again, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. And so we come to prayer. The wind whispers our name, unique individual, a gentle murmur, barely perceivable, and we turn away thinking it was just a dream. The Spirit gently utters our name, unique, individual, barely distinguishable in the bustle of life, drowned out by higher priorities. And the voice of God calls out our name, unique, individual, persistently demanding, and we turn our heads listening for the voice of the divine. And as we listen, we hear the groaning of creation, the rumble of thunder, the crack of lightning and the splitting of rocks, the gushing of water, trees rustling and chainsaws cutting, the cogs of industry turning and the fumes belching. And as we listen, we hear the cries of the earth's people. We hear the plotting and the scheming and the attention-grabbing headline. We hear the sound of tanks and gunfire and the crackle of fire. We hear the machinery of harvest and the hollow ring of empty cooking pots. We hear the newborn babies cry and the unquenching tears of the morning. And as we listen, we hear the din of traffic on the road, the occasional wail of police sirens and the gossip on street corners. We hear the stories of our tradition and the stories of our shared lives. We hear the noise of children playing and discussing ideas for themselves. We hear the adults' mumbled liturgy and the words of much-loved hymns. And the voice of God calls out our name unique, individual, persistently demanding, and we turn our heads, listening for the voice of the divine. Amen. So we conclude our worship as we sing our final hymn, a prayer once again for the breath of life, of the Spirit of God to come sweeping through us and revive us. So we pray, Holy Spirit of God, send us out. Gentle Spirit, calm our fears. 
Spirit of truth, lead us to a broader vision of your work. Spirit of strength, in our weakness, make us strong. Spirit of power, show us when and how to act for you. Holy Spirit of God, send us out. Amen.